a lot for the introduction, and thanks so much for having me here. Thanks, WordPress, uh, for letting me not work today to be here enjoying myself in a theater in Paris. Uh, the topic of this presentation is something that I've been working on for many years because, as you said, I've been working on real-time projects a lot like Socket.io and Node.js and this ability of creating networked applications that work really fast. But more important than the concept of real time and sockets and networking is the idea that we have to create applications that are really fast. Uh, the single most important factor when we think about technology and, and how technology gets replaced with new technology is something is happening faster. We're either having teams develop faster or we're having users experience data exchanges faster over the internet. Something is happening with the, this idea that we are focusing on the experience by exchanging data in, in a way that's completely real time. So uh, I set out to basically look for basically the history of Node.js and how this speed idea really came to play. Because I remember in the early days, we didn't really have a marketing line. We didn't really know how to explain the project. We were just doing V8 uh, on the server side, which again, happened to be a really fast JavaScript engine. So I remember like looking at the HP public cloud blog and they were starting to describe it for us as something that would outperform competitors. Uh, I don't know if you can read this, but recently uh, PayPal also announced that they were switching away from Java to JavaScript. And again, what they're talking about is some things that they're finding that are way faster than what they were doing before. And not just exclusively with how fast a page can load, but also teams getting, getting stuff out, out there faster, iterating on things faster. Um, even like LinkedIn, when they rethought their mobile application, this is an interesting case because they rethought how they were doing the front end uh, with something that I'm gonna be talking today about, which is this idea of doing single page applications, which resulted in a big increase in, in performance, but also, they found again that development time was really, really fast with this combination of a lot of JavaScript on the server with Node and a lot of JavaScript on the client. And we can, the, the natural conclusion that we can derive from this is that the success of your application, of your product, is directly correlated with the performance that results in a really good user experience. And also, it can result in the failure of your application. So if, if you guys remember, um, this uh, Facebook, the Facebook CEO saying that they were switching away from HTML5 to native, it caused quite a stir. And the, the main reason they noted was performance. Once they redid their application, used less slow HTML5 at the time at least, uh, their, their uh, app store reviews went from like really low rating to really high rating. So the consumer approval was expressed within weeks. People were waiting for something that was faster. And of course, this made all the tech block, tech block news, and, and you guys might, might remember it as a, quite a scandal. Um, and the, the, the point that I want to make today is that if we, if we look at this natural progression of how things are moving and how products get adopted based on performance, the best way to make a web application today is undoubtedly doing a single page application. And I'm going to describe three unique opportunities that sometimes get ignored that single page applications provide that will allow you to make the case that single page are, is extremely superior in any case. So it's not just about the speed, but also the perception of the speed that we can focus on. And something that um, creating your entire front end with JavaScript will allow you to do is, again, create this illusion, make something react immediately, even though the network, for example, might not have responded. Uh, there is a conference called Velocity that focuses a lot on these aspects. And Steve Soders, who works for Google, gave an example of how does this perception of speed idea play out in the, in the real world. And an example he noted was at the Houston airport, when you are done, when you landed, you would go to the baggage claim, and then you would stay there waiting for your, for your bag to come about. But what they decided to do was make the walk from when the time you land to the baggage claim six times longer. And by the time you're there, 
the bag is there. So you, the perception of speed is just incredible. Like people were way more satisfied. They were not sitting around their tire waiting for their bag to come, but the time they spent was the same. If anything, they made them exercise, but they were happier with it, which is awesome. So how does this apply to what we do? So I think the most important thing we can make to basically increase the solution of speed is that we can react immediately to user input. When you think about the way that the browser works today, if you click on a link, the user might not see anything. They might see a little bar at the top. They might see some slight movement, but nothing is really changing. So with JavaScript determining how everything works, we can capture any event, and now we can adapt what's happening to that immediately. So the first opportunity that single page apps provide is that when we capture this user input, we can render the eventual layout of the page that's coming immediately with no weight whatsoever. As fast as we can change the DOM, that's how, the, that's how much the user waits. So an example of this done really well is Google. The moment I, I, I wrote G, the entire layout changed. So we can see that again. And the network was definitely not there yet, but they knew what the eventual layout was gonna be, and they were optimistic about the network data, of course, coming back and no errors happening, which is actually the most common case. So uh, we took this idea that you, we, we wanted to do something uh, at our company whenever you, you clicked on anything. And what we decided to do was, since CloudUp was focused a lot on sharing content, we knew that the CloudUp URLs that were gonna trigger some page with, with content, which has a black background, we could, we could trigger them as soon as the history API would give us the event that a URL uh, contained a C when it starts. So for example, when you press our video, the first thing we do is we render the layout that's gonna come later. So we can see that again. It has a bar at the top. That's, not, that's the DOM basically being empty. And then we make parallel XHR calls, one for the user at the top left, and then one for the video. And the user has that, this immediate reaction. Um, and this actually is inspired by um, Apple. So when they released the iPhone, the first version, it didn't, it didn't seem that way at the time, but if you compare it with an iPhone 5 today, that thing was super slow. And one thing they did to create this impression of speed was they would have you ship a default.png photo with the layout of your application. And the moment that you touched any icon, they would first render the PNG. So they decided decoding this PNG image was faster than actually relying on application developers making a really fast app that reacts immediately. So What's interesting about this is uh, something that the mobile platform has done really well that we don't see as much on the web platform. They had a lot of constraints to begin with and they came up with really creative solutions for creating this speed um, perception. And the, same, and the same goes for the constraints of the network. Since a lot of things can go wrong when you, when you try to send a packet over a mobile network, they also apply a lot of optimistic techniques as soon as you touch a button or as soon as you try to snap a photo, they usually have some offline cache or they have some immediate reaction that some data was saved. This is an example of that screenshot. It seems silly, but as soon as you would press an app, this would load and everything would seem faster. So we also extended this idea when you log in. So I'm gonna talk more about the reactivity aspect of this later, but as soon as you log in, we would populate the layout before the user document uh, basically, the, the request that would bring the user would come back, and the same for the dashboard. We only, knew, we only needed to know how many streams you had in order to render a bunch of empty blocks. And then you could uh, scroll, and we would lazy load the ones that were relevant for the viewport. So the second opportunity that's particularly exciting for me is that we also can get rid of a lot of spinners. When you use techniques like PJAX, or those dynamic HTML loading techniques, what happens usually is that you, you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know what HTML might come back. You don't know what the, what the user's gonna do next. So what you end up doing is you blur out a, a certain part of the page or you load a big spinner and then something comes. It's in, a way, in that way, the application doesn't know what's coming. So the way that I explain this is we started with Ajax, which was a web 2.0 thing and that, to me, meant just spinners everywhere. Like, seriously, everywhere. <laughs> so 
again, with this idea of acting on the user input immediately and rendering optimistically, spinners basically go away most of the time. Uh, I'm gonna show you a, a quick counter example of this. So for example, I was editing a comment on GitHub and when, when I press update, it's gonna show me a spinner, which I don't need to see. I could see directly the change and the same goes for deleting it. And obviously the network latency is arbitrary, so I could be looking at a spinner for like 10 seconds. So actually what we could have done instead is, and this is a technique applied by Gmail and others is, we can make the change ref be reflected immediately and then for example, if the user tries to navigate away, we can show them a message that says, no, we're still sending data to a server. But if the user was gonna do something else, like review a code diff, or just leave that tab hanging, he could, he could go on with his life. So we took this concept once again, and we applied it to, for example, editing the title on the top left. Or even, I'm gonna go and edit, and then when I remove, we fade it out immediately. And then I close the tab, didn't trigger a warning, I was hoping it would, but it was too fast. Um, but once again, you can see also that the editing of the title at the top also reflected on the dashboard. And that's the next point that I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, that said, there's still opportunities in which spinners and other sorts of visual feedback might be needed. Uh, important uh, actions like logging out because you wanna make sure that the next person doesn't access your data because of a network error or uh, a payment. Uh, in, in those situations, you might want to produce some visual feedback. That said, uh, spinners should still be rare. And to make this point, I'm gonna refer to the uh, research that was uh, produced by Nielsen in 1993. They had concluded that by looking at all the data that they had on user interaction, uh, for the last 30 years, the consensus has been that under 0.1 second, the user has the uh, experience that they're acting directly in the data. This would be a case of, for example, you edit a spreadsheet and you have no doubt whatsoever that the moment you erase a cell or you change some value, it's there. And no so, sort of feedback is required. Between 0.1 and one second, and this is what I think is really relevant to us, because th that's usually the amount of time that most network round trips or several network round trips with backend loads take, this is a sweet spot where we actually don't have to produce any visual feedback. In that, in that period of time, the user doesn't need to see a spinner. And then we have the situation over 10 seconds, which is awful. It's like JVM boot up kind of thing. And again, if what we decided to do is if the network round trip would not exceed um, once, if, sorry, if it exceeds one second, in that situation only, uh, we show a spinner. So when we log out, we trigger a wide layout right away, and if it takes over a second, uh, we show a spinner. And that's, uh, of course, the worst case scenario. Normally, the situation feels a lot better. So it feels like it's just a regular fade. Um, the last opportunity that I'm the most excited about and I developed a new project for is the idea of synchronizing data. So, this idea relates to what happens when you change data on the backend and the user has multiple sessions of your application open. So, or what happens when the user closes their laptop, they open your application later by resuming their session. How do you make that tab or session catch up to all the data changes that happen on the backend? And once again, the only really good way of accomplishing this will be by you assuming that you're gonna write your entire application with a dynamic JavaScript front-end. So the, the main idea here is that uh, we can make the front-end react to data changes through events. So on CloudUp, for example, I have uh, here, I'm gonna open the same session that I had opened on my browser. Password is banana banana. And I'm gonna upload a photo. So you can see that my other session is reacting to this data change immediately. Once again, this is, of course, what I, we usually call real time, but to the user, the, the only way that he can describe it is that he's experiencing just a fast web application. Of, of course, he doesn't need to press the refresh button to trigger the change. And uh, we can also extend this idea to uh, the login state. If we consider that the session is also a document 
whose data we need to synchronize. So we also extended this idea to synchronize sessions. So if I have two tabs open and I decide to log into one, both log in. And if I log out on one, the other, well, the other one will as well. And we make every view reactive to the session change. So if I'm looking at a stream, then I, I start looking at it as if I was logged out. And uh, the technology that powers this in particular is called MyDB, which is a layer on top of MongoDB in which the way that you expose documents to the client and the way that you retrieve them continues to be through a RESTful API, but then the document that you get on the front end has this ability to stay up to date no matter what happens on the back end. So if you're familiar with Ajax, it's, it's a good natural step. You just require a document. For example, in this case, I'm requiring a slash profile, and then I get this user document with a lot of properties. Now, imagine that some other user or an admin or the same user on his phone goes to some other endpoint that changes this uh, name property. And what would happen on the back end is we would have a query that alters that particular document. So as a result of this, what we're gonna get is the event's gonna fire with a new value. And the front end can then decide to do whatever they want. You could, for example, trigger an animation where you were displaying the name of the user. I have a quick demo here. Uh, that you can actually reproduce on your computers. So we have this session object, which is like a MyDB instance, but, re but actually it's just a regular object. And then we have the user object. In this case, they're both empty. We have the user key, uh, it's undefined right now. And then I just register an event uh, to notify myself what happens when uh, that user property changes. And it's just gonna console log something. So of course I log in on the same tab. This is not too different from what you experience on any other app. Uh, now the user key is populated, but now I'm gonna go ahead and open another instance and I'm gonna log out. So now the user ID is undefined and the, the object reacted to that change and so did the UI. So uh, if you wanna try this out again, you can sign up uh, to cloudup.com with the special code .js uh, we created the easiest, hopefully the easiest way and fastest way to share anything and consume it uh, in a very natural way on your mobile device or your desktop. So thank you.